Welcome everyone to the second episode of the Young Thinkers Gloucester uh, webinar series. Uh, we have a very special guest today, uh, Asma Pandor, who's actually local to Gloucestershire NHS Trust uh, and has been an Admiral Dementia Nurse there uh, for the past few years. Uh, we'll be talking about dementia today, which I feel is a really important subject, particularly because uh, as we reach winter and, and various health problems can occur, um, our loved ones who might actually have uh, dementia, having the most information we can will really help to support them. So we'll be introducing dementia, a little bit about um, the diagnosis side, but also about what kind of support is available, particularly in Gloucester. If you haven't already seen our first episode on Young Thinkers Gloucester, head over to our YouTube where we talk about diabetes. Um, so I'm going to uh, just start straight off. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Asma. I really appreciate you coming coming on uh, on our webinar. Um, can you just maybe start a little bit by telling us about your role as, a, uh, as an Admiral Nurse and, and how you um, became an Admiral Nurse? Yeah, so I've been working as a nurse since 2010. Um, and started off working in ED and acute care. Um, and from there, I kind of grew my love for, for elderly care. One of my first jobs, even before nursing, was when I was in sixth form, I worked for age, it was age concern then, it's now age UK, um, as their admin assistant. And I already knew that I had a love for, for elderly care then. Um, mm -hmm. And then I also did a little bit of work in one of my roles, even before nursing again, same. Um, when I was waiting to go to uni in a care home for dementia and that's where I, I, I found I actually like this but from nursing I went into work for um, ED and acute care and I really enjoyed that that was really fast Um, went on then soon after to work as an elderly care ward system ward manager and did that for a long time um, for about six years and really really enjoyed that um, there was lots of varieties. It wasn't just people with dementia, it was people, um, any elderly person. So elderly in hospital, we can't count them as anyone over the age of 65. Mm -hmm. um, and they sometimes have a lot of health, different health conditions. So that was really, really interesting. And I, I really enjoyed that, enjoyed supporting people. The best thing was making people better and sending them home. Um, and then this role came up just post-COVID. So it's a new role to the trust, so post hospital right. Um, started um, and I thought actually yeah this is something that I've dementia you come across a lot in our elderly care patients actually I thought I'd love to gain more knowledge more experience and support more people and that's where the role that's what the role is there for I'm lucky because actually the role is funded 50% from Dementia UK and 50% from my trust so the Gloucester Hospitals Trust Right. Um, okay. My training and service training and resources come from Dementia UK so hopefully it's more up to date it's it's in touch with they have a lot of people with dementia that support them in terms of their their policies and how they support people so there's lots of it's really really useful information that we get from dementia uk and then we can then support people so my role in terms of the hospital i do i cover both gloucester and chatham hospital um and it's about supporting people with dementia in that acute settings the acute settings we talk about are our, our hospital settings um and hospitals for anybody are horrible. Um, for people that have got dementia, they might be confused, they might be more disorientated, um, or just scared. And actually, that's a lot of us when we come into hospital. And for yeah. advances to support people with dementia, it's that it's that supporting them through this transition where it's really, really different to normal life. Um, supporting them. But it's not just about supporting the person, because we know that supporting as family, as carers, as loved ones, as anyone, as friends, as neighbours, supporting someone with dementia, it's actually re can be really, really tiring, can be um, a lot for the emotionally draining. It can, there's lots of impacts on the person caring for that person. Caring can be anything from supporting for half an hour a day to half an hour a week. It has no, no limits or on what we look at in terms of caring, but it's supporting, it's offering support for that person also, although that group of people also. Um, and on top of that, I also support the staff on the wards because we know that now post COVID more than ever, hospitals are busier, we're, we're more stretched, there's less staff. And actually if we can support the staff to, to enhance and empower their knowledge and skills, the care that we give our people to mention and their families and carers and loved ones will be better so my role is is quite a wide-ranging role but it's, mm -hmm. it's a really really good powerful role 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's quite interesting um, that you touched on COVID there, and I'm sure we'll, we'll probably end up coming back to that at some point. But really, even just the concept of an admiral nurse, the way you talk about it being a bit more holistic, I suppose, than when we think of um, certainly, say, just a, a an elderly care doctor or um, a, a nurse uh, on the wards or in clinic, I suppose it kind of it sort of spreads into different parts of, of different jobs and almost tries to bring it together for the family um, and, and for the patient. Do, do you feel like the admiral nurse in some ways that role is, is made more so for, for families and, or caregivers uh, as well as just the patient? Absolutely. And I think that's what we find most is that communication can sometimes be tight in hospital because there's, there's lack of time is a, is a, it's not the, always the best example, but lack of time is lack of staff always contributes to it too. And you're right. We, we are where there is that kind of bridge between everything. So we, we bring all the information together and make sure that we've got that contact with family members, with, with carers, with loved ones, neighbours, friends, whoever is in that support to involve with the person with dementia and to make sure the person with dementia is involved in all of this. Because I think what's what's most common is that pe people think that people with dementia haven't got that. Sometimes they lose their voice, especially in hospital, because they can become more confused, more disorientated. So actually, they may not be able to communicate their needs, but actually they may be able to. And it's making sure that we're, we're respecting everyone's views, treating everyone as an individual, and then bringing all of that together to be sure that we've got the right pathways in place the right plans in place to support everybody so I think one of the hardest things that I find is that um, people come in and they don't always think they're listened to well enough and actually sometimes that can be down to miscommunication or lack of them telling the whole story and where they're to build that relationship and trust up with families with the person with dementia with the staff and to build that trust in that relationship so we can understand the whole the whole period of their time with us and, and then support them through it so we know that they're, they're listening to each step of the way for all, all of us so our staff our, our people with dementia and the, the carers and loved ones yeah and I think um in that sense um I suppose it is probably by the sounds of it, a reasonably new role particularly in Gloucestershire um and it's maybe adapting to the needs of things I, I think you mentioned there that in hospitals unfortunately it can get quite tight and busy especially with um certainly updating families but also in some ways um giving that voice to patients um where they need more time and certainly in our um, elderly populations but particularly dementia they do need more time to express things it, in your role do you um i've certainly seen you from the sort of acute settings the secondary care setting um is it something that you also have in terms of more clinics or kind of outreach as well is that something that I've uh, that admiral nurses tend to get involved in or so they do we differ there's lots of admiral nurses and we differ in the roles that we do so my role is very much I say it's very much hospital based so mm -hmm. between Gloucester and Chatham but actually that's probably not true in the sense that we do reach out to community settings and we do community engagement events we've we're in Gloucestershire we're actually really lucky because we've got lots of community dementia support already out there for people um and I link in with them and we then do community engagement events so I do lots of community work but my primary role is to support people in in that acute settings in Gloucester and Chatham hospital um, but you're right, I do I do reach out to people in the community and make sure that they've got the right so, And I'm always available. Sometimes it's literally just a phone call to say that we send yeah. most people to the right sources and resources available to them. Yeah, I think that's a, um, quite important at times, isn't it? But having that point of contact, I know certainly um, to contextualise for viewers, um, myself and Asma have actually worked uh, in the same in the same setting. And it was probably in that kind of time, just as COVID was still quite present, uh, but as a as a sort of junior doctor on an elderly care ward, when we'd have um, maybe a patient who who's been admitted with dementia or um, someone who we're suspecting there could be a background of it, we would then make that sort of contact or, or referral in formal terms to um, asthma, and then it just means that um, there is a point of contact as well as the ward team, and the family also could then um, sort of. Uh, have a point of contact uh, and certainly give more time to certain uh, questions or or even concerns um, and on a ward that's certainly a very a very impactful role to have I think even the nursing side 
um, because they're so sort of tied up with various um, physical health kind of problems in terms of observations or drug, uh, drugs and medications. Having someone who can who can do a slightly different role, it, it's a very a very sort of uh, important aspect to have in in a more holistic care. Um, coming away from the role in particular, I suppose for our viewers um, who may not have familiarity with dementia or maybe are, are sort of newly um, uh, sort of having to uh, learn more about it, perhaps because someone they know has now got that diagnosis. How do you how do you sort of approach those conversations when you're when you're speaking to maybe a family member or even a patient who's very new to dementia and doesn't really have much of an understanding? How do you make those first conversations? So for me, it's always finding out what they know first. And so we, in fancy terms, we call that our collateral. So making sure that the family, or the person with dementia themselves or the person with, with confusion themselves, finding out what they know about their own their own condition and actually what they what that how that impacts them so actually sometimes it's not about making that diagnosis itself it's about making sure that we've got the right support in place so seeing what what parts of their life are affected by by this this new condition that they seem to develop actually how long it's been going on for what support they feel that they need what support they feel their family may need and then kind of working on from that so it's starting right at the basics and then working on from that and finding out what this condition means to them I think that's what's most important is some people when dementia is still quite a taboo word um, and when we when we look at dementia we're trying to break it down actually it doesn't it's not all bad um, we can, if the right support's in place, we can we there, you know you can live well with dementia. You can live in the community. People people don't a lot of my people that I support people don't know that they've got dementia because they can hide it so well and they've managed so well up to now. And it's making sure that they've got the right support networks to do that. Um, when we talk about dementia itself, we normally think about that short term memory loss of forgetting things really easily. Um, and that that is quite a common symptom of it, but that's not the only symptom. It can be a whole host of other symptoms, um, some of them being communication issues, so actually that loss of speech, the loss of understanding of what people are saying. Um, sometimes we talk about things like functional um, issues, so functional by that we mean things like they can't do things that we, they would normally be able to do. So for a lot of our Muslim community, we talk about people, sometimes they forget how to make muzul, how to pray namaz. Um, other people, it's making, they forget to make a cup of tea, forget how to use a cash card. Um, it's things that we would, we kind of take granted for a lot of our for a lot of us and actually it's remembering that 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 can be one of the signs that family first notice or the person first notices and it's building all of these little signs up to build that bigger picture before we look at that initial diagnosis yeah i think it, it it's really interesting that you mentioned that i think when a lot of um perhaps the general public or people who have less familiarity with medical things they think of dementia as that short-term memory loss don't they it's, and it and it almost becomes a focus that it's just that it's you know you're forgetful and and as you as you age you just become more forgetful and some people become extra forgetful and mm. um, when when you look at the sort of nhs page it's those things that you're you're sort of mentioning in the sense that um it can actually affect your daily life to quite an impact um and it's important to sort of draw that distinction that it's it's not just a normal part of aging it's a it's an actual sort of medical process the nhs uk website for the general public calls it a syndrome um associated with ongoing decline of brain functioning um, and there are actually many different types um which you know we, we may touch on in terms of the, the alzheimer's or vascular dementia but broadly speaking they they give some symptoms um, like memory loss, your your language, um, your understanding, your judgment, even mood. Um, and I think all those things, when you really think of that list, it must impact that individual, you know, in so many different ways. And, and I suppose from your own experiences, I, I'd, I'd be really fascinated to hear um, what kind of impacts have you seen on the individuals when they're maybe newly diagnosed or when they're sort of some way along in terms of their diagnosis, how 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 can dementia impact people? 
I think you've, you're right in what you've said. It impacts their mood the most, and especially when they come into hospital. We see people more and more isolated, more and more introverted in their in their behaviours because they they feel that sometimes when we've spoken to people it's because they feel ashamed of of having this condition they don't know how to behave so they just shy away from from going out from social activities from talking to anyone and that then adds to their condition because actually then they they're not aware of, of what's going on because they, they they stop watching the news they stop listening they stop reading papers and actually that then makes them less aware of what's going on around them um, in hospital, a lot of people say that they they feel that people don't talk. To, they feel that they one of their fears is that people won't talk to them because if they tell them they've got dementia, because people will think they're forgetting things. And actually, that's such a misconception because they might remember even a part of what you said, if not all of it. And actually, just having that conversation with them, it's, I think my biggest thing to everybody is always treat people, treat everyone the same, treat everyone well respect everybody um in the same way because we're we're all individuals and it doesn't matter what condition you have whether that be diabetes whether that be dementia you're still that individual and that person is never lost in the person with dementia um sometimes people say oh they've gone back in time to a time when they were younger they're still that person that they are yes they've gone back into their reality of when they were 20 when they were 30 but there's still that person somewhere inside. And by talking to them, you might relive some of the good moments with them and actually build that relationship up. So it's all about enjoying the time you have with them and spending these quality moments with them, enjoying whatever time of their life they're in, actually enjoy, accepting that reality and enjoying that time with them. Mm, I think that's a really um, in, interesting and, and probably impactful point almost to take away from the whole conversation is that we really should... Um, see the see people as as the individual still and and not really take anything away from them because of a diagnosis of dementia i think certainly from a healthcare perspective you know you see people in different parts in the journey certainly at the start of the journey when when things are quite new but also unfortunately at the very advanced dementia stage but it's, a, it's such a key thing in, in healthcare that you really should um still focus in as the individual um with your own role do you feel um and 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 it's and it's a difficult uh time in the nhs we know that but how how well do you think dementia is is currently being managed particularly in in gloucestershire i suppose but but also widely uh, are there any shortfalls or areas you think that um could be better managed in that sense from uh, as teams you you've worked with or seen or or Conversely, are there, are there really good things that we're doing that we need to keep on doing with dementia, do you feel? There are really good things. So in Gloucester at the moment, in Gloucester Hospital itself, we've, we've made a dementia-friendly ward. It's been open for about a year and a half now. Um, and we're trying to replicate that across. The, so we're having lots of work done in Gloucester Hospital itself. So it's trying to replicate that across the hospital. And it's things like more artwork, um, more the wards, the bays themselves are, are painted nicer. Um, and just that aesthetic approach is actually nicer to make it more homely. We we don't want people um, with dementia to feel scared while they're with us because actually that's that's a factor that will impact their their condition more. So actually if they can feel safer in our environment, and that's why we make some, we have dementia friend dementia um action activity groups and they're on our more more so on our Cather Adley Ward. So we've got four Cather Adley Wards in Gloucester and Cheltenham. Um, and we have dementia activity groups and they're people that we've trained up who support people with, with dementia to do things like um activities like bingo, crossword painting, any anything that they might like. We can we then incorporate that into the group. They do some exercises with our physios and our therapists, um, just to help them engage more, help them have a little bit more fun while they're with us because it is a really scary time for them. It's again taking away that it's that feeling of making them feel safe if they can as much as we can in our hospital. Um, some of the things that we can improve, I think communication will always be one of the things that we can improve. Um, sometimes talking with that person. We do, I do at the moment, I, we've done for the last three years, we do a national audit for dementia um, and that's run by our Royal College of Psychiatrists um, um, and that comes to our hospital and we, we look at patients and we look at the everything. So we're looking at if they've come to any harm, so by that I mean, have they had a fall while they're with us? Have they developed any pressure damage? Or how is their 
stay in hospital being and we look at patients we then send out questionnaires to the people with dementia and to their loved ones and their carers and their families and we try and collate they collate all this information for us and give us feedback and reports and, and that allows us to kind of improve our care for the people with dementia and I think one of the most um, one of the points that sticks out for me the most is the fact that people with dementia feel really isolated in hospital because they feel that we as staff walk past them and ignore them and I think that's why I always try and put across the point that if we treat everyone as individuals we talk to them even if they if you don't feel they're taken in they might just take in one part of your conversation I think that's always my hit home message is treat everyone as individuals treat them with love respect and dignity and we we won't go far wrong I think absolutely and and just coming back to that in in the sense where you were mentioning creating that welcoming or at least feeling safe type environment in on the ward um i'm currently so as part of my gp training i'm currently doing a, an inpatient psychiatry job where we do see um patients patients with advanced dementia because it's sort of in pay, uh, old age psychiatry and and we had a lot of challenges in terms of the medical team <clears throat> managing one particular patient um and I think what actually was the turning point was something we didn't expect, which was actually um, our sort of team. Uh, we have uh, occupational therapists who work with families as well and, and talk about interests. And, and we realised this person had a, a real interest in, in playing draft. Um, and suddenly the, the whole landscape of them was, was completely different. You know, he was engaging a lot more, had a good social activity sort of fixed every day. And it and it really made me think as a medical professional that actually, you know, sometimes we're we're looking for that one magic drug or one magic sort of um, treatment, and there's so much more to individuals. Um, as you, as you've sort of hit home quite a few times, that actually individualizing um, uh, sort of patients, but also I suppose from a sense the the family perspective as well, and 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 what their their activities were before the diagnosis don't necessarily have to just completely stop um, after the diagnosis, I suppose it's fair to say. Um, and on that, do you, in, in terms of families and, and the people who are really involved in in, um, in care, how do you sort of approach um, tackling dementia or talking about dementia with that kind of inner circle of people who will be involved in, in this person's life uh, with their dementia diagnosis? I think it's, it's letting them know that support is available to them. So in Gloucestershire, if when you get diagnosed with, with dementia, you're automatically then given a dementia advisor who's someone that works from the outside society and you're given a community dementia nurse. And the two of them will work hand in hand to make sure that you've got the right support. So they might not speak to you all the time as a family member all the time, but they're always there. The dementia advisor specifically is always there as, first port of call so if you needed anything if you were struggling or if you just wanted more advice if you give give the dementia advisor a call they're more likely then to advise you and sign post you to areas if they felt that you sometimes what, what i find is that we give people lots of information and we give them and then we we kind of send them away and they've got tons and tons of people to call and books yeah. to read and leaflets to read and actually that can be a lot so it's for us as, so I do that a lot and I know the dementia advisors do that is sometimes it's just us making that phone call for someone rather than saying can you make that phone call because that takes away a whole host of stress from from you if you don't have to make that phone call if you then just get updated with actually someone's coming to see you tomorrow or this is the plan for you that helps and it's time for making sure they've got that right support in place for them and I think that's why we're lucky in Gloucestershire so we have that so for Gloucester and Cheltenham we have is our community teams called Managing Memory together right um, and i'll give the phone number a, a bit later but managing memory together is is our service and they kind of hold the dementia advisors the community dementia nurses other psychiatrists work with them so lots of people they have therapists they have a whole host of of professionals working with them and they're all there to make sure that there's support available so they have education sessions for people with, people with dementia themselves their families neighbors loved ones anyone involved in their care in any way that wants to go along they've got regular information sessions um, and then they've got a, line, a phone line you can call if you just need a bit of advice and you don't need to speak to someone specifically about a certain thing but just want some advice so then they'll happily provide that support for you as well so it's making sure that people know that services are available for them and, and on top of that dementia uk themselves 
have the admiral nurse helpline. So you might not, your loved one might not be in hospital, but you still feel like you need that support and the helpline is there for exactly that reason. It's just make sure that people living in the community have got the right support and, and there are people that will know about the community services available to each individual area and they're then signposted to that area or give you the advice and support that you need over the phone to be sure. Then the admin nurses would then catch up with you regularly to be sure that you, you've got that support. Again, if you needed them to make the phone call, they'll make the phone call, but it's making sure that you're accessing the support available for you, for your loved one, for your family member, anyone who it is. Um, it's making sure that support is taken up. Absolutely. I mean, the word support there, you, you've sort of really emphasised there in terms of what what is needed and what, what is provided in terms of the services. From your own experiences, how have you seen the sort of families and caregivers um, experience dementia or, or how can it impact them? What what sort of things have you seen in your practice? How How, how does dementia sort of take hold? I think it's, it is, it's, we have to remember it's different for everybody, but some of the common common signs and symptoms that we see in people that affects everybody is the lack of sleep that they may have. So dementia can, as it progresses, can cause become, can cause people to become incontinent. And that means not being able to know when to use toilets, and then they wet themselves. And actually that can cause a lot of strain for the family member if they have to constantly clean up the carpet, clean up the bed sheets, you know, all of that can be really fatiguing. And to remember that the person... Dementia isn't just for our elderly patients. We do get dementia uh, from any age range. So that there's lots of different, there's over 400 types of dementia um, mm. and it can affect most age ranges. But on a very general note, we're looking at our more, more elderly population. And so to remember that their, their loved one, their husband, if they're a husband and wife, they're normally that sort of age range too. And actually the impact that it can have yeah. on this person, having to, to support them, the lack of sleep that people may, may get can be really, really hard. So people with dementia, um, often they get what we call sundowning. So sundowning would mean that generally by about three, four o'clock, they become more confused, more disorientated, and just not themselves. Um, and this can happen regularly and every night, and it can affect the amount they eat, the amount they sleep. And actually for a carer or for a loved one to have lack of sleep can then impact the care that you can give to that person. So it impacts everyone's day hugely. Um, and we know that our social, our services in the community in terms of our social care is impacted massively and there's a massive um, gap in the amount of carers that we have that go in to support people. And one of the things that we find hardest, to be honest, is that we don't offer support at night time. And that's mm. probably the hardest time for people with dementia and their carers and their loved ones is that they're awake all night and then they're expected to just get up in the daytime and carry on like normal. It doesn't always work like that. Um, people say, you know, I've been told to, to sleep when my loved one is sleeping. So my love, my person with dementia is sleeping in the daytime, but I've got hundreds of, hundreds of other jobs to do in that time and I can't do it. And actually it's remembering that these people have got lives to live. Um, and it's that, it's that support that we need to pop in for them. So we do have things like respite options available. So the person can go into the care home for a short amount of time. We do have, if people, it comes down to, to finances sometimes if people can afford to pay for nighttime carers they can bring that they can find a care agency that will support um is using different services so sometimes we have we 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 use a lot we use um age uk um the carers hub and they're really really good services at supporting with providing that emergency care so if you needed a few days where you just needed your own time it's there available for people to be sure that there's support available sometimes people only need a couple of hours and that's what people we have um help at home service from age uk that provide right. exactly that that provide that support so you can have a couple of hours where you just do your own thing um, and you kind of that's your time to rest and recuperate yourself and then you, you feel okay I think the most important factor is guilt um, you, if you look after someone at home all the time and then you feel that you're asking for help you feel really guilty that you shouldn't be asking for help because it's your loved one and actually remember that that's not what well, we are we can never take away that feeling of guilt from people but actually remembering that it's not it's okay to feel guilty but it's not an issue we we're here to support people so they can live in their own environments as much as possible because uh, the biggest 
the biggest factor in terms of guilt is when people are moved from home to care home. And mm. I know that in, in more Asian communities, in Asian communities, Black African Caribbean communities, in some of our Eastern European communities, we feel that we can't do that because mm. we might be, there's lots of reasons, but some of them are because we might be looked down upon. But the most important reason is because we feel guilty that we can't give the care and we should be given that care. And actually, it's okay to ask for help, whether it be for a short-term period or a long-term period. There's absolutely no shame in it. It's sometimes remembering that that person going into a care home, for example, allows you to go back to having your husband and wife relationship or your daughter and mother, daughter and father relationship, rather than being that carer himself, allowing people to take away that stress from you so you can carry on living well. Because if we we always talk about glass half empty. Um, and if you can't look after yourself, you'll be you won't be able to provide the best care for your loved ones. It's making sure that ultimately you look after yourself in the best way that you can and then you can then offer the support to the to your loved one with dementia yeah i think uh in some ways that it's really um a common feeling uh that you touched on which is the guilt aspect but certainly um we hope that having these kind of conversations and showing um the common experiences and challenges hopefully give people a chance to reflect that the guilt is 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 not warranted or there's actually it's perfectly reasonable to to ask for more help with our you know maybe that so one of our viewers or someone who's who's watching this has felt that they they previously haven't been um as open to getting more help but now they they would want more help where where would you sort of recommend that they start if they're feeling that sort of sense of being a bit overwhelmed and up till now trying to manage things on their own maybe it was a husband or a wife or even a son daughter where should they start do you think so i think if if, if it's to do with someone with dementia i definitely start with managing memory together um, mm-hmm. and their phone number is 0800 694 um, and they'll definitely be able to signpost in the right ways to make sure the right support is available um, Carers Hub, Gloucestershire is actually a really, really good source of support for everybody. So anyone, whether you have dementia or not, or you're mm-hmm. supporting your dementia or not, if you need support in terms of carers, Carers Hub is definitely the best place to go. Um, but with regards to dementia managing memory, I definitely um that'd be my first call to call for anybody. Um and then add more nurses and add more helpline. Again, they're able to signpost people and their phone number is 0800 888 six six nine eight um and they're they're both free phone numbers from from most landlines and mobiles and it's just using them to support people perfect i think we will make sure we add those on um into our uh video link below i'll just also um bring up some of our q a that we had uh, received from uh, uh people who who sort of subscribe to our social media um, so if we, we we can fire some of those as well, uh, and we've got some in, interesting ones. Uh, so there's a question, uh, all anonymous. Uh, do you think there's a delicate line between determining capacity in dementia patients, as capacity can be harder to determine as the condition worsens? And I'll just um, just to sort of contextualize that for viewers who who maybe aren't familiar with the word capacity well, I suppose what we mean is the ability to make decisions for them next or something to have a procedure or an operation or something so I suppose do you think there's a delicate line between determining capacity in dementia patients um um, yes, capacity is always a really, really um, delicate issue in itself because actually capacity, what, remember, what we have to remember is that capacity is specific, is decision specific. So it can be a whole host of things. So we can't say that a person with dementia doesn't have capacity, it doesn't work like that. It has to be upon about that specific, specific decision. So for example, we normally, so when we're there in hospital, we normally say, can this person consent to capacity while they're while they're in this hospital setting about their care needs. Um, and we're looking at things like do they know where they are? Um, do they know the reason they're there with us? Can they retain that information? So can they remember that information? Can they then talk to us and communicate their needs? 
um, and how are they managing? Sometimes we talk about communicating their needs, whether that be by their verbal communication or by non-verbal communication. It's making sure that we we give everyone the right right resources to be able to to talk about their needs. It's a really difficult um, thing. I would never just say that someone with dementia doesn't have capacity because it doesn't work like that. But it's very it's quite a yeah. Um, and we have lots of conversations about it at the moment is to making sure that we're doing we're doing the capacity assessments in the right way to make sure that the person with, with dementia we're given is making sure that you're giving them the right to speak up as much as they can so even if you feel that a person in hospital lacks capacity to consent to their care needs you can still ask them uh, ask them every day about certain things that they want doing and respecting their decision they might it might just be a bad time for this by that i mean Sometimes we, when they're in hospital, they need, we need to take bloods from them regularly. But there might be a time in the mm-hmm. morning that they just don't like their blood to take them because they they normally they like to sleep at that time, or they're they're not completely awake and don't completely understand what you're doing. But if you came back later on, they might be more susceptible, and more acceptable to you taking their blood. So it's it's sometimes about managing the capacity themselves, but also about making sure that you can understand that it can fluctuate that it can change so you can go i could go and make an assess- assessment on someone and say that i i feel that they they have they lack capacity to make decisions about their their care needs someone else could go along half an hour later and say actually i disagree but it's not about one person doing it wrong or doing it right it's about in that time do you think the person is able to communicate their needs do they understand what's going on are they able to communicate their needs um and it's making sure that the aspects are, are kind of all covered, so it can change from day to day, from hour to hour. Thank you for that. Um, I think, yeah, absolutely. As it, just just by that answer, you can see it's quite a complex issue, particularly with capacity, but also capacity in patients with dementia. I think clearly another question from a healthcare professional on this one about um, uh, how can healthcare professionals support patients with dementia, for example, when trying to do certain things such as taking bloods or giving medication? Um, do you have any tips for how to support patients with dementia in those circumstances? Yeah, so it's to make sure that they feel safe and they understand what we're doing. One of the things that we do in hospital, which we we I don't think we even recognise that we're doing, is that we automatically take our medications off everybody and we then give their medication. A lot of people are used to taking their own meds at home. Whether they've got dementia or not is irrelevant to it. They take their own medications, they know how to take it. They know that they're on four meds a day and that's that's normal to them. And then we take it away from them and expect them to then take it from us. Um, we change people's routines um, and that has a massive impact. So it's sometimes it's getting to know the individual, worth knowing what works for them, using family members if family members are happy to come in and support, using different ways. A lot of people we say that... Um, is to allowing them to understand what you're saying. So by that, it doesn't, it's not always about not understanding the language. It's about... Give, making sure they can see you, they can hear you properly. We we have, again, a lot of us healthcare professionals have a tendency to stand at the edge of the bed and look down on our patients and actually making sure that you're, you're at eye level with the patient, you're sat down or you're crouched down next to them so they can see you, they can hear you, making sure they've got their glasses on, their hearing aids in, their dentures in so they can communicate their needs. Um, If they're, they, they can't, if they can't speak, then it's using signs and symbols to help mirror and image things so that we can make sure that they've got, we've given them every chance to be able to communicate their needs back to us. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of doing it. I think probably from personal experiences as well, if you if you can get, as you're saying, to the level, you know, finding different ways of communicating, not always just how you communicated with another patient, individualise it as you've, as you've really been emphasising throughout this talk. Um, we'll do try and r- wrap the last couple in as well. Um, um, uh, it, are there ways to spot signs um, of patients with dementia being mistreated, um, particularly from the family? Uh, it's a slightly difficult question, I suppose. Um, is there any signs that, or things that we, again, probably sounds a little bit more healthcare orientated um, that you, you've found in your work? Okay. Yeah, it's about looking for untoward things. So looking at bruising, looking at when they come into us, is there anything that we we can see? Do they look scared when this family member visits? It's not always as easy as it sounds, but if you've got any concerns, I'd raise that with so if people are living in their own homes and you've got concerns about any form of neglect or negligence from anybody, whether that be family or anyone that goes in, you can contact adult social care. 
and they'll look into it. Um, and mm-hmm. there's an adult help desk that people can contact. Um, yeah. But if they if they're, they're in hospital, then absolutely raise it to the to members of the staff, and we can then look into it to see. We have a safeguarding team in hospital, and just by involving them doesn't mean there's something wrong. It just helps us work with other individuals to look at what we can do to support this person to make sure that they're safe in their own environment and they're safe with us in hospital. Yeah. Um, are there any groups of people who are more at risk of dementia? Um, so potentially, yes. So our inter- we never talk about numbers of dementia to start with, but currently in the UK itself, there's roughly 944,000 people living with dementia. Um, mm-hmm. And when we break it down to our ethnic minority communities, um, we're looking at that being roughly anything between 25,000 people. Um, but the numbers of people from my ethnic minorities is supposed to double by but they're brought to 50,000 by 2026, meaning a couple of years' time, um, and with the steepest rise to be in our South Asian communities, with the number set to increase to 172,000 by 2050, which in terms of figures is a sevenfold increase in 40 years. So we're at the moment, we're roughly 3% of the UK population in terms of ethnic minorities and people with dementia, but that's supposed to rise to 28% by 2050. So there is, there's mm. a lot of work going on to look at why some of this might be. A lot of it is because we're looking at vascular dementia. So we're, as Asian communities in itself, we're more at risk of getting things like diabetes, stroke, cardiovascular disorders like heart attack, stroke, and they all intertwine together. So if you've got vascular problems, you're more at risk of getting vascular dementia. Um, in exactly the same way, it's the, the way that the body's processing the blood and the way that the blood's been stopped from going to certain parts of the body, uh, especially the brain, and that causes the vascular dementia. So it, there is a lot of research going on, um, and it will be, it will be, um, that's what we need to make sure is that we've got the right support in place for our different communities, for every community. So it's not just specifically from one community, it's all communities to make sure that the right services and the right support is available for all of us in the community and in the hospitals to be sure that we're getting it right for everyone. Yeah, and, and I think, um, interestingly, when when you mentioned that about the vascular side of thing, I think I saw it from uh, the NHS descriptions on dementia that uh, treat your brain as, as you would treat your heart in the sense that the things that are good for your heart are, are likely to be good for your brain in this exercise and um, reducing your cholesterol getting good diabetes control if that's a problem. And um, and perhaps now, as we know, you know, people are living longer and, and these kind of risk factors will come into play. Um, those are the the, the sort of uh, questions from the audience. I suppose um, my way of, of, of kind of finishing this, uh, this webinar would be a question to you in terms of... Um, for you, from your perspective, but also from families' perspectives, what would be the take-home you'd want people to go home with about how can we best support people with dementia who are our loved patients or um, just even, you know, people we know of and, and we want to just do do more to, to support people with dementia? What would be your main take-home messages for that? I think my main take-home message is treat them as an individual. If they do things that they still enjoy, don't stop interacting with them because you feel that they've got dementia, um, carry on as much as you can and reach out to people. So that our man- managing memory together and our admonish is reach out to them because we can be sure that you've got the right support for yourself to then support the person with dementia. So I think support and accessing that support is probably the most important important factor for me. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's certainly something I will take away as a clinician, but also I think for people that I know of with dementia, you really um, brought that home about individualising um, our care and people. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we've really enjoyed uh, discussing quite, a, I think, a topic that needs more awareness, particularly um, in some of our sort of target audiences in Gloucester. Um, because we know that dementia, you know, the, the figures are there, as you mentioned, uh, is, is going to continue to rise. And, and probably we're not that well equipped at the minute, some of, some of our communities and in, in our knowledge. And I think this type of conversation really hopes, hopefully opens some of those doors to, to further conversations and, and showing people that actually their experiences might be common um, and, and their experiences uh, they're not alone in and, and there's actually a lot of support available will we'll certainly 
um, signpost those uh, particular links and phone numbers that you really um, said are, are, are very helpful locally. Uh, and I think that's really helpful for our viewers and, and listeners. Um, but thank you very much, uh, and, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, bring you on again to discuss things in the future about how Gloucester is progressing with dementia and the community management. Mm, that'd be lovely. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video and podcast. A uh, great big thank you to our guest speaker, Asma Pandor. For more content with health podcasts and what we're up to, please give us a like and subscribe at the bottom of this video.